everybody, this is Peter Diamandis with my coach and my dear friend, Dan Sullivan, and welcome to Exponential Wisdom. Dan, a pleasure to be with you, and I want to talk about something that is palpable to me, which is that the rate of change is accelerating, and I want to talk about why it's accelerating. Are you you with me on this? Yeah, I'm totally, you know, further away from the action than you are, but I keep track of it every day. Yeah. So my mom used to tell me, Peter, the world's accelerating. I said, come on, mom, it's not accelerating. You know, it's like time is pretty much a constant and so forth. But the amount of stuff we can do in a day is exploding. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy, right? Because it's like, oh, my God, it's like you and I have talked about this before. It's choosing to say no sometimes is like the most important thing to do. But I just wrote a piece. I'm working on my next book called Convergence. It's the follow up to Abundance and Bold. I call it the ABCs of exponential. And there's a chapter in there that I just completed called Acceleration of the Acceleration. Mm -hmm. Let me lay it out. And I want to get your wisdom on what am I missing? Do you buy it? You know, what are you seeing? So we all have heard about Moore's Law, the idea that you put twice as many transistors on a piece of silicon per dollar every 18 to 24 months. And that's what Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel, observed. And that Moore's law has continued for 50 years, and it means our computers are twice as fast when we go back and buy the next one. Mm -hmm. That's been the basics. But on top of that, what's interesting is the following. First of all, I've been tracking this because I raise a lot of money, and I have a venture fund that invests a lot of money. We're at all-time highs in the amount of capital flow, right? So angel capital, venture capital, crowdfunding, ICOs, sovereign funds, 2017 was an all-time high for all of those. So there's more mm -hmm. money available. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that's accelerating things, I like to say no bucks, no buck Rogers, right? So lots of money to do cool stuff with. Mm -hmm. And then the fact is everything you are you can do is now getting cheaper, right? Computation's cheaper. Genome sequencing is cheaper. So your money goes 100 times or 1,000 times further. And then we've talked about this as well. There's more people being connected on the planet than any time ever in human history. Mm -hmm. More people are doing stuff. You know, all these things are accelerating the acceleration, so to speak. Do you buy it? Yeah, totally. And every six months or so, I go back and do your checklist from Abundance and the great intro that you have at Abundance 360 of 100 things or so that are getting better. They were this way, their, their way. And just as I was preparing for today, I read a Wall Street Journal article this morning about now the people who are declared to be in poverty has dropped from 36% to 10% essentially in the last 20 years. And that shows you because these are not people who are the recipients of multiplier technology in the sense that they're doing it directly, but it's just the overall increase of capability and resources in the world is now making it possible for people just to meet their basic needs. It's amazing. I talk about the fact that we're demonetizing everything, right? Mm -hmm. The poorest people in the world are going to be driven around by chauffeurs while they sleep in the back, mm -hmm. right? Because an autonomous electric car is going to be five times cheaper than owning a car. So why would you want to own a car mm -hmm. when you can be chauffeured around five times cheaper? That means you can get a bigger house because it's an hour away from your work instead of 10 minutes away from your work because you don't care about the commute time because you're sleeping or playing games in the back seat. Mm -hmm. And then the cost of electricity is plummeting, right? It's going to be 10 times cheaper for electric renewable energy sources in a decade. Yeah, and I think one of the big things that if people meet their basic needs and then they're healthier for much longer, you have that much more aspiration on the part of human beings to take advantage of new things. Exactly. So that means one of the other things accelerating the future is that there are more people creating new companies and an I define an entrepreneur very similar to what you do as someone who finds a great juicy problem and fixes it. Mm -hmm. And more people fixing more problems makes the world a better place and makes things automagical in a wonderful fashion. One of the things, Peter, I say there's two types of innovation on the planet. There are creepers and there are jumpers. And mostly okay. there's a, an enormous amount of innovation that happens every day that just doesn't show up in the media or anything. The jumpers, you know, you're in touch with a lot of the jumpers. Mm -hmm. They're bringing discontinuous, what I call discontinuous innovation, but actually humans do both. They do incremental innovation and they do 
discontinuous innovation. So creeping is, you know, you've got something and you prove it by 20% and then you pass it through a team. So there's an exponential, but it wouldn't show up on anybody's radar screen. It shows up in productivity. And I think that the population growth is a function, a lot of creeping innovation, but you need these constant jumps, a leap where you just introduce something brand new and then it goes through its disruptive stage, drops the price, you know, makes things smaller, makes things more available. So it's not just, a, you know, a hundred innovators out there. There's billions of innovators. They're all doing something new. They get a cell phone and all of a sudden they innovate a new form of marketing, a new form of cooperation. In the poorest places in Africa, they're using their cell phone to bypass monopoly markets more innovatively than we do here because the mother of invention, right? We don't have that level of necessity that they do. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, and the big thing is smart people. I was just thinking, you know, I grew up in a town which had around 100 years ago was about 6,000, it's now about 16,000. And I often remark because I look at the photographs of this town and I said, you know, I bet this town had more smart people in it than it does now. And the reason is that the smart people moved away to critical mass areas so where the smart people could be all together. But I think what's happening is a little bit of a reversal now that smart people can be in contact and be where they are. That's a brilliant point. I think about that if there was a Mozart or a Gutenberg or a Einstein who was born in a remote village in Africa that didn't have any communications or didn't have any books, that was like a seed being dropped on the proverbial rock instead of the fertile soil. So now we're heading towards a world where everybody's connected any place on the planet. So those anomalies of the outlying, you know, three nines will show up. And it just takes one Einstein to change the world. Yeah. And the other thing, by the way, is that we're going to increase intelligence by connecting your brain with the Internet. So we're going to have more smart people because we're connected yeah. at a level never before. Peter, can I ask you a question? Yeah. You know, you're scouting the world, you're mapping out where innovation is happening. Is there any place in one of your trips recently where you were surprised that you found innovation where you weren't expecting to find innovation? Wow. So that kind of accelerating effect where you didn't think you would find it there, but you're noticing it. Well, I'm going to uh, leave tonight, in fact, for China for 10 days. We're running an Abundance 360 program in Shanghai, and I'm taking a number of my A360 members on a trip to meet the CEOs, the top Chinese companies. But what's fascinating about China is it's a bumblebee in some ways. You would have never expected it to be so accelerating so rapidly from an innovation standpoint. And it is in a way that's extraordinary. You know, I remember decade, 15 years ago, was so much conversation about China as a copycat country. I think most Americans still have that perception, but it's not. They are innovating at an extraordinary rate. And the amount of capital there, because a lot of the capital can't leave the country, so it, it turns back in mm -hmm. towards the entrepreneurs. And there is a massive Darwinian competition, mm -hmm. winner-take-all modality there, so I'm going to China with a shopping mindset of what partnerships do I create? What, mm -hmm. what ideas do I absorb? What investments can I make? So I think you know, China's been amazing. Dubai and Israel, mm -hmm. again, the Middle East, I think because the cauldron mm -hmm. that is there from a multitude of different ways it has been driving yeah. innovation at an extraordinary rate. Another place that is just at the beginning is Puerto Rico, because the entire crypto community has been moving to Puerto Rico and because Puerto Rico has been so hammered by weather, by hurricanes, and because the tax is so low, it's 4%, and a lot of people are bringing their wealth and their companies there, yeah. that it's setting up an interesting ecosystem for massive experimentation. But I think the point is that we're going to see acceleration around the world. It isn't just happening in Silicon Valley because the tools to innovate and accelerate are every place. Mm -hmm. You know, another driver of the acceleration that you're passionate about, like I am, is we're living older, mm -hmm. right? And so a lot of people 
you know, say, oh, it's, you know, I'm 60, 65, time to retire, which is like the worst thing you could possibly do, right? And the most successful people I know, when they're hitting 70, they're like, I'm just now hitting my stride. I just now know which way, uh, the wisdom. I mean, you feel that way, right? You're not even halfway there yet. Yeah, and I I say, instead of thinking older, I think of living longer, younger. You know, in other words, that you're extending younger, longer. Maybe that's the... Yeah, you phrase. (laughs) That's the goal, that basically what I devote in my book, my game plan for living to 156. I know this is small potatoes in your world, but I'm I'm happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> Not small potatoes, buddy. Yeah, but the aspect about it is it's interesting in the book. I got eight chapters, and the eighth chapter is about age reversing technology. And I start the chapter by saying, I'm going to now talk to you about technology and medicine, but if you don't have any of the previous seven mindsets, none of this is going to be interesting to you. You know, you probably won't even get to chapter eight if you don't have mindsets. You know, it's all mindset driven. I mean, everything that you're talking about, whether people are profiting from the acceleration of acceleration or they're feeling victimized and they're feeling totally reactive, it's all a function of mindset. It is. And I'm so excited to read the book. What do you call it? My Game Plan for Living to 156. That's a good direct name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. And, you know, I tell the story and you know the story, so I won't repeat it. But, you know, this is really, really interesting. And this is real measuring stick. I had a financial advisor from Montreal right. who had been with me in the 90s, came back three years ago. And he said, when I read this book, I realized why I came back. You've just given me permission to extend my career another 20 years. Yeah. It is all about mindset. Yeah. It's all about mindset. Yeah. People don't realize that, right? It's like if people said, okay, Peter, what's the number one thing I should do right now if I want to live longer? It's your mindset. It's believing that you can. Yeah. And people who retire, you know this, the stats are pretty dour that death follows retirement. Closely. Pretty closely, yeah. What did you say? What's your phrase when you talk about retirement? Well, first of all, for entrepreneurs who are my main, I said it's a sudden and instant loss of capability. (laughs) You've just lost massive capability because you took yourself out of the game. Yeah, and you're telling your bits it's time to give it back to the environment. Yeah, and I said at the same time that you notify the government that you're ready for retirement benefits, a message goes to the center of the universe, and death perks up and says, oh, I got a pickup. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> There's another big force that's accelerating, and perhaps it's the biggest force that's accelerating the rate of change. And let me take a second to talk about it. It's what I call the interface moments. So I learned something that at the end of the day, our ability to do something big and powerful, build companies, create new technologies, are a function of our ability to use technology, to create new technologies. And I was interviewing Mark Andreessen, God, this is years ago. Mark was the creator of Mosaic, the first web browser. And then he went on to create with Jim Clark Netscape, which was so successful. I remember interviewing him on stage and asking, well, how many websites were there the first year? He said, well, the first year that a browser existed were 23 websites. And then the next year there were 10,000. And the next year there were like a million And we just saw this exponential explosion. And what was interesting was that the browser turned out to be the interface moment Mm -hmm. for the ARPANET. So the Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA, built what is the internet Mm -hmm. to connect all of the top supercomputers, then supercomputers. Now they're far less capable than the phone in your iWatch, the computer in your Apple Watch. And it was like connecting Stanford and MIT and Washington, D.C. and NYU and all these universities. But it was so difficult to use that system. But the browser made it possible to use it in a graphical user interface modality. Mm -hmm. And then people started building businesses on top of it Mm -hmm. that used the Internet. And it's like, wow, that was like an interface moment where I, the user, had an interface to this very powerful capability. And so what's going to accelerate the future in a massive fashion is that AI is the ultimate user interface, Mm -hmm. where in the future, if I want to 3D print something and I don't know how to program my 3D printer, I can just talk to an AI and say, can you create me some kind of a vessel to hold coffee? And I'd love a handle on it. And can you curve the handle? And 
can you make it out of a material that's thermally insulated so it retains the heat and can you color it this color? And, and as you're describing verbally what's in your mind, and AI is visualizing it for you in your augmented reality glasses, and you say, how much does that cost? And it costs 30 cents. Can you make it half the cost by changing out some materials? Mm -hmm. And then you describe what you want. You go, that's it. And now print it for me. Mm -hmm. and right, So AI is going to become the user interface moment for you to use CRISPR technologies for gene editing. If you know nothing about gene editing, hey, can you create me a gene that can cut down my glucose intake or mm -hmm. create me genes that increase my muscle mass. So it's the ultimate user mm -hmm. interface moment where all of us become so incredibly enabled by these exponential technologies. Yeah. Peter, I couldn't help but thinking because they say, well, Peter Diamandis must have the most advanced mindsets in the world if he's going around looking at these things. But you're always shifting, too, in relationship to new things that you're discovering, new inputs from people All the time. You know, who are very advanced. So in the last 12 months, what would be three ways that your mindset shifted? Because I think everybody would be fascinated because you're not just at the top of the mountain like a wise man delivering messages. You're actually experiencing that you have to shift if you're going to keep up with your game. Yeah, I mean, one of the ways that was interesting is it's all about that the experience matters, right? It's like I spend so much time. So I'm watching my kids watching a video in which the person in the video is opening up packages and then is this slow unveiling and unraveling and this entertainment. So my kids are watching this person open up this thing, this particular package of toys and so forth. And I'm watching them. They're glued to it. And then my mom comes over and brings the kids these dinosaur eggs. And inside the dinosaur eggs are these little plastic dinosaurs inside. And what the kids need to do to get to those plastic dinosaurs inside this large looking egg was you have to soak the dinosaur egg in water. And then they give you this chisel. You have to carve away the dinosaur egg and the dinosaurs left inside. And it, the realization was if they had just gotten a package of these little plastic dinosaurs, they would have looked at it and go, eh, but it was the process of soaking it in water and carving away the egg and unveiling the dinosaur, little plastic dinosaur inside. And that whole process was the focus. Yeah. And so in life... It was also analog. It wasn't digital. It was analog. But my point was that I'm realizing that how a person gets to the final result matters mm -hmm. and how that process is entertaining because we humans love that serial unveiling and the unraveling and the mystery and the what's inside. And those things are hardwired into our brain. And so in the programs that we create, that kind of entertainment and that unexpected yeah. needs to be part of it. So that mindset, it's not just the wham, bam, here's the result. It's going through the process that is critically important. You know, just to throw in a shift for me, and it's been a continual shift, and it has to do with the longevity thing. And I said, you will not live longer if it's not fun. Dude, so correct, right? So on the mindset, interesting. So we talked about this before. I was at the Vatican for an XPRIZE adventure trip. One of these days, I'm going to get you and Babs to join me on one of these adventure trips. I'll keep on inviting you forever. I'm going to have to shift the entire XPRIZE organization's calendar around Dan and Babs' calendar to get you guys there. Well, that's a project. That, that is, that is. That's, <laughs> that's like dinosaur eggs. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm on stage with a cardinal, a rabbi, an elderman, and then the head of the NIH, and we're talking about longevity. And I remember asking the audience, how many of you would like to live to 120? I expected the entire audience's hands to go up and they didn't. And it was like a third of the audience went up and I was like, oh my, I didn't say, oh my God. I said, I probably said, oh my goodness. I didn't want lightning to come strike me down in the middle of the Vatican there. And then I said, okay, what if you're healthy through 120 and still yeah. not all their arms went up. And Tony Robbins was there as well on this trip and we spoke about it. And Tony was clear, you need to have purpose and mission in your life. Oh yeah. It's all about having purpose and mission 
that is bigger than you and it's bigger than your 80 years. And when you have that, you know, it's like, I want to go stand, you know, walk on the moon and become the mayor of Lunar City. Damn. I want to go walk on Mars. I want to go and, and see other star systems. I want to, you know, mm-hmm. I can fill a couple hundred lifetimes out of these ambitions. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a new experience. You may have said it, but I contextualize it this way. I said, we're living in the first period of human history where your longevity is going to become negotiable. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, I think of children born today can have, if they desire, an indefinite lifetime. Yeah. What are they going to do? Yeah. You know, I think one of the things they're going to do is explore virtual worlds, create virtual mm-hmm. worlds, live in virtual worlds, mm-hmm. live multiple mm-hmm. lifetimes in multiple virtual worlds. Mm-hmm. You know, I just moved into a new house, Dan, and I've been thinking a lot about the real estate business and how real estate is going to change using all these exponential technologies. I know you have a few homes and you've been dabbling in the real estate business and a lot of the people that you coach Mm -hmm. are in the real estate business in one shape or form. If you're up for it, I'd love in our next session, let's do a dive in how the real estate industry is going to change. Yeah, well, it's interesting because I just had a podcast a week and a half ago with Dean Jackson in Toronto, strictly with real estate brokers. And Dean's a great map maker for the real estate world. So I'm fresh off this topic. So let's do it. Yes. All right. So I hope people got that the world's accelerating for a multitude of different reasons. And the rate of acceleration is self accelerating, which just means it's going to be an amazing adventure in the next 20 years ahead. Hold on. It's going to blow us all away. Okay. All right, Dan. Talk to you soon, pal. See you on the next Exponential Wisdom. You got it. See you soon.